So Apple's first official event for 2021 is now done. And boy, did they announce some important updates and upgrades to their services and especially their hardware. I guess the predictions were on the right track, but some odd few surprises and curveballs. This is gonna be my quick fire recap of Apple's 420 spring loaded event. Let's go. Hi, Ben from Lover of Tech. If you enjoy videos like this and you're new to the channel, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you're part of Team TLS, the Tech Lover Squad, so you don't miss any future videos on the channel. So as stated, there were a mix of products and services, updates and upgrades Apple dropped from the Apple Card to Apple Podcast, a new color for the iPhone 12 and 12 mini. Air tags are also finally official. New Apple TV 4K with a redesign for the Siri remote. And the last two major upgrades and changes come to finally a fully redesigned iMac, which we're gonna break down later on and get into later. And finally, a proper spec upgrade for the iPad Pro, which I wasn't even expecting the level that they went to. As you can see, within the hour long event, Apple had a decent amount of things to go through. And I have to say, one of the products really has been tempted after many years now of never feeling the need to upgrade or even own one again which I'll let you know later on in the video. I won't be unpacking each product and service that was announced in detail, only the ones that really interest me and the product that I'm tempted by, which we're gonna discuss a bit later. Firstly, it's a new color to a product we've all been too familiar with since September, 2020. And that is the iPhone 12 and 12 mini are now getting a purple color finish or as what Tim Cook called on stage, gorgeous purple. Oh, Timmy Tim Tim. Apple doesn't always do this, but bringing out a new color for their current generation iPhone halfway through its release cycle is something they've done before. And I remember them doing this with the product red version of the iPhone 7 and 7 Plus. Look, everything else is the same. With what you've known to love about the 12 mini and iPhone 12, it's just a new color being added to the lineup. Next one is an update to Apple's Find My Network, which if you've all been too familiar with using Find My iPhone on an iPhone or an iPad, you will know that it can come in handy and I'm gonna speak for myself recently, man. It helped me track down my iPhone 12 Pro Max when I lost it. So yeah, one of the benefits of using an Apple ID with iCloud. But we have a new addition to the family. Air tags, and I'm sure people are glad that these did not become dead before arrival, like air power, and finally are official. I have to say, this part of the keynote, I realized how Apple are really good and know how to suck you in with their good marketing presentation because for what seemed like just normal NFC tags, Apple somehow made them seem like they're more than what they are, especially since you can make them your own with customizations. <laughs> I guess. Great presentation and promo aside, right? Let's put these aside. These are basically working in conjunction with Apple's U1 chip in their products like the iPhone to give you precision finding to your AirTags on things that you put your AirTags on, such as your keys and your bags, etc. How well it's going to work, really only time will tell which should be very soon as Apple is saying these AirTags are going to be available 30th of April for $29 or $99 for a four pack. They are also saying privacy is something that they've put at the forefront of the overall design with measures put into place for unwanted tag detection, rotation identifiers, and audible alerts for unwanted tags, all on the basis that AirTags are for tracking items and not people, of course, and obviously. We will have to cautiously take their word for it until further testing or findings. But for now, these are air tags and people, they are official. A quick look at the new Apple TV 4K, which is now powered by the A12 chip with a redesign for the Siri remote for hopefully better control. They showed a demo of how your iPhone can be used to compensate for the color balance on your TV in what Apple was saying should show you more accurate colors when watching your shows through the Apple TV 4K. Very interesting. For me personally, not much to be said for the Apple TV 4K. It comes in at $179 and $199 respectively for 32 gigabytes and 64 gigabytes and should be available second half of May. Whew, people, now it's time to brace yourself, you know? We are now gonna get into the meat and the potatoes, the big, big announcements, starting with the Mac. Now, unless you've not been following the computing space in the tech world over the past year or potentially living under a rock, we all know the introduction of the M1 Apple Silicon on the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro 13 inch and the Mac mini caused a massive shift in performance and especially performance per watt with their system on a chip design working with Mac OS software. Apple said back in November 2020, this was just the beginning and they meant it because today finally sees the M1 chip 
come finally to what has felt like an eternity to a ground up redesign to the iMac. The new iMac is now a 24 inch display with a 4.5K Super Retina display up from the 21.5 inch from before, which then sits nicely between the size of the 27 inch iMacs that we've known before. It comes in seven new colors, which I have to admit, based on the renders and what I've seen so far, they kind of look decently nice. We don't want to see them in person. But for me, the overall design, which is just so thin, it basically looks like a standalone display. Respect where respect is due, because the only way they've been able to achieve this is all due to how much less space is taken and needed to run. Power, cool. The system on a chip design of the M1 Silicon, and this is something that they showcased in the presentation, which just looked crazy to me. When it comes to that all-in-one computer design, the iMac has been leading the way for years now. And even for someone like me, who prefers expandability of working on a desktop PC, this is impressive, I have to say. Now, in terms of connectivity, you get four USB-C connections at the back. Two of them are based on USB-C generation four ports, and two of them are based on Thunderbolt generation four ports, which can support external displays like the 6K Retina XDR display from Apple. Just to be safe, the headphone port is still there and not dead yet on the iMac, but they have removed the Ethernet port and placed it on their new magnetic power adapter. I guess it was just a bit too thick for how crazy thin the iMac is now. And look, I'm going to say this. One thing that did surprise me was Touch ID is now available on the new Magic Keyboard wirelessly, which Apple has stated does come in a numeric keyboard option as well. If this is not a sign and statement that we just need to bring Mac Touch ID on new iPhones later this year, then I really don't know what it is. Apple, please just bring back Touch ID on the flagship iPhones as well, please. It looks to not just support the biometric logins and payments that we all know, but also fast profile switching between different users. Nice touch. This is a good look and makes the redesign of the iMac really feel complete from the outside looking in. The only thing left, and it's gonna be a crazy one me saying this, is for Apple to place a battery inside the iMac, making it the first truly portable all-in-one desktop computer. Yes, like I said, it sounds crazy, but the efficiency of the M1 chips are so good that maybe I reckon Apple might consider it in the future. Who knows? With a $1,299, $1,499 price tag, the new iMacs will be available second half of May. Very exciting. Oh, time to take it all in. Last but not the least is the iPad Pro. And there we were thinking the M1 Silicon would only ever belong in the Mac family since the ACV Silicon pretty much have made their place on an iPad for many years, even to the point where the A14 chip was placed in the latest iPad Air, giving it more processing power than the outgoing iPad Pro. I guess the people over at the iPad Pro team were definitely not having this as they went as far as taking the M1 Silicon and now placing it in both the new 11 inch and 12.9 inch iPad Pro. This is a massive move and especially brings iOS and macOS even closer than ever before and could sooner rather than later see apps like Final Cut Pro really make its way onto the iPad. All the performance and benefits you know from the M1 lives in the iPad Pro, even as far as now turbocharging the USB-C port to generation four that supports Thunderbolt. Like seriously, all this improvement to the USB-C port on the iPad Pro. It can't be too much for Apple to finally get rid of the lightning port on iPhones. Please give us the USB-C like what you're doing. The move to USB-C generation four should fix the external display scaling and move the maximum resolution to 6K as well. Well, wireless connectivity wise, it does come with 5G now, Wi-Fi 6 and the latest in Bluetooth 5 technology. Yes, the cameras have been improved with the new selfie at 122 degree field of view with center stage feature, but that's not really something that really catches my interest here. For me, it's the display. But there is a slight catch because really the improvements to the display will only really be on a 12.9 inch model of the iPad Pro. Now what Apple are claiming is that they're bringing the XDR tech from their 6K display to the 12.9 inch iPad display with a 1000 nit all screen brightness and a 1600 nit peak brightness using mini LED screen technology. Look, in simpler terms, I'm making this as simple as possible. Mini LED should give you the best of both worlds when it comes to both IPS LCD as well as OLED. Again, in simpler terms, you still get 120 Hertz ProMotion tech for that smooth responsive experience, which I really hope 
to see a new iPhones this year. Please, Apple. There seems to be also a white color, new white color for the Magic Keyboard for the iPad Pros, as well as a two terabyte option and up to 16 gigabytes of RAM, all thanks to the support of the M1 chip. Now, it's starting at $799 and $1,099 respectively for the new iPad Pros, which should be available end of May. Now, these are pretty much all the things we got for the 420 Spring Loaded event. And out of all of these products and services, which ones are the ones that interest me the most? Is it AirTags? Nah. Or is it the new iMacs? Now look, as much as I really, really like the new iMacs and I'm really impressed with what they've been able to achieve, I'm a person personally, when I'm using my main desktop computer, I really do need expandability, especially through things like PCI Express. So although I am very impressed with the all-in-one capability of the new iMacs, it just isn't for me. Not for me personally, it's just not for me. But it's the iPad Pro, especially the 12.9 inch model, since I'm a person that really values having a top display experience. I've not had a reason to have an iPad for what feels like almost four years and over now until possibly what I've seen with the 12.9 inch iPad Pro. But overall, there are two things that are holding me back, which in fact is, firstly, the fact they're still using a single USB-C port. I know they've turbocharged it, but I would have loved to see two USB-C ports. Just put it out there. It might be a reach, but that's just for me personally. And then the overall software experience of iPad OS. Now look, I know iPad OS has come a long way from back in the day, but with WWDC 2021 just around the corner, and now that the M1 lives in the iPad Pro, I hope they can really bring that statement of an iPad being a real computer to life. That is it for me in regards to my recap for the 420 Apple Spring Loaded event. What services and products really caught your interest? Because for me, man, that 12.9 inch iPad Pro has got me interested. Let's just see what WWDC has around the corner to really wrap up the overall experience. That is it for me, Ben from Lover of Tech. If you enjoy videos like this, you know exactly what to do, man. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell so you're part of Team TLS, the Tech Lover Squad, so you don't miss any future videos on the channel. I hope you're all safe during this time. I will catch you in the next one. Peace. Thank you.